Let's read together. The Lord is the light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Father, we thank you that we can rely on you. When we're in fear, when we're uncomfortable, when anxiety overtakes us, we thank you that we can turn to you, that we can come to your throne of grace. Um, we thank you that you are our light. We pray that you would continue to light our way so that we wouldn't walk in darkness, but that we would see the light of life. We ask you to be with us as we worship. We pray that you would be glorified and honored, and that you would be exalted. We ask you.
darkness we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophet, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt.
When death was resting, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love for. Be lifted higher 
put diamonds on a black velvet background to show the contrast so that you can see the beauty of the diamond 
more clear. It removes any background distraction. And because of the darkness of the background, you can actually see colors within the diamonds <coughs> themselves that you wouldn't normally see if you were just to hold them in your hand. In the next set of verses in chapter 8 that we're going to cover, Jesus is going to claim to be the light of the world. His glory and His beauty are seen all the more clear against the backdrop of the blackness and the darkness and the sinfulness of man's heart. Kind of like what we saw in the last week when we talked about the woman caught in adultery. <clears throat> talk about sin. Talk about darkness. Talk about blackness. All they wanted to do was trap and ensnare him so they could accuse him, if you remember in the story. They didn't care about the law. They didn't care about the woman all they cared about was their reputation and all they cared about was trying to entrap Jesus so that they can accuse him. That's what that whole story that we went through last week is all about. <clears throat> they wanted to trap him. If you remember, if he let her go, they would accuse him of being a lawbreaker. If he said stone her, they would accuse him of no longer being the friend of sinners. Now remember, during that story, Jesus was teaching. And they came barging in and interrupted his teaching. And Jesus, after he exposes them in the story, exposes their own sinfulness, he uses the opportunity to go into his teaching about being the light of the world. He goes from the interruption and in exposing the blackness and the darkness of man's sin to use it as a springboard to go into his teaching about him being the light of the world. Because that's what light does. It exposes darkness. It reveals things. When you go into a room and you want to find something, you turn the light on. Because it'll expose it. It'll show you where it's at. It'll reveal things that you've not seen with the light off. Think about this statement. You'll have to listen good to get the statement. <clears throat> have you ever noticed that bothered people get bothered whenever they're bothered? Does that make any sense? <laughs> Some people just get bothered whenever they're bothered. That's why they bother people. I can be that way, truthfully. Just to be honest, I can be that way. If I'm in the middle of doing something and someone bothers me, I can become a bothered person. So I, just from the truthfulness of my heart, this convicted me. But Jesus takes a totally different approach when he's interrupted. When he's bothered in the midst of his teaching, when the people come barging in. And I'm sure they didn't. If you picture the story, remember they came barging in with this woman. And they didn't just walk in and say, excuse me teacher, we have a question for you. I don't think it was that way. I think they completely interrupted him. He takes the interruption in stride. Realizing that the interruption, the unexpected encounter, 
the unforeseen problem is an opportunity for ministry. And that's the way we need to think of things when we're interrupted. Instead of getting all bent out of shape. Instead of thinking, man, we just leave me alone, I need to finish this. Oh, I wish they wouldn't have showed up. I need to get this stuff done. I need to mow my lawn. I wish these guys could go somewhere. You know, I mean, that's how people think. That's how we think. We function along our own schedule, our own way of doing things. So if we can function the way that Jesus did in that account, when he was interrupted, when a problem occurs, or if we have an encounter with somebody, maybe we could just stop and think that maybe this is an opportunity for ministry. Maybe God has opened up an opportunity for ministry. Just like I said this morning about this woman coming in for church, comes, spends a day with us, and then goes. We need to look at those things and maybe God has opened doors for ministry for us as his children. And not be bothered. Let me read that one more time. Have you ever noticed that bothered people get bothered whenever they're bothered? Some people just get bothered whenever they're bothered. That's why they're bothered. But Jesus took a totally different approach. So we need to follow the example that Jesus set in this story when he was interrupted. He was not, and he is not, a type. He just used the opportunity. Picture that story. Remember last week we went through the whole story of the darkness and the sinfulness of man's heart. Jesus used that whole opportunity to step into the next section and say that I am the light of the world. In light of this, I am the light of the world. So I hope you have your Bibles. If you do, let's turn to John chapter 12. That's the wrong one. Let's turn to John chapter 12, starting at verse... Uh, John chapter 8, starting verse 12 to verse 30. I'm going to read. <clears throat> That'll take... This next section of John. John chapter 8, starting at verse 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone in it. But I and the Father who sent me, even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one seized him, because his hour had not yet come. Verse 21. Then he said again to them, <clears throat> I go away, and you will seek me, and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, Surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, Where I am going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. 
For unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. So they were saying to Him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, What have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but He who has sent me is true. And the things which I heard from Him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize that He was speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own initiative. But I speak these things as the Father taught me, and He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. As He spoke these things, many came to believe in So we're going to jump back to uh, verse 12. <clears throat> and what I want to do is the same that we've done, is just kind of walk through these, uh, this passage. Okay, now we need to look at what he said in context of what was going on in Jerusalem at that time. Remember, we were co just coming through the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. That was the feast that was just taking place, the celebration that they were just celebrating. Um, remember the Feast of Booths. Remember what took place. During the Feast of Tabernacles, there was a ceremony that was called the Illumination of the Temple. Okay, you remember in the last time we talked about the Feast of Booths, I talked about they had the pouring out of the water. And every day the priest would go to the Pool of Siloam, take water, pour it out near the altar for the people. And then on that last great day of the feast, they did not pour the water out. And that's when Jesus cried out, I, Come to me and drink. If any man is thirsty, come to me and drink. Okay, so this is a continuation of that feast. Remember now, the feast had just uh, come to a conclusion. Okay, there was a great ceremony called the Illumination of the Temple, <coughs> which involved the ritual of lighting of four golden oil-filled lamps in the court of the women. These lamps were huge menorahs, or candelabras, 75 feet high, lighted in the temple at night to remind the people of the pillar of fire that had guided Israel in their wilderness journey. Understand that? We'll get past that. That's out of order. We'll come back. There's your candelabras. Four poles. Jewish history says it was 75 feet high. And they had four lamps on the poles. That young men would climb ladders and light those lamps as part of the ceremony. That's during the day. That's what it looks like at night. Jewish history says that sometimes it was so bright that they claimed it would light the whole city because of the brightness of it. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Because of the brightness of it. That was to commemorate this. Okay? So what they did was they did this to remember when God led them through the desert with a pillar of fire. Okay? All night long, the light would shone. The light had shone their brilliance. It is said, illuminating the entire city. In celebration and anticipation, the holiest of Israel men danced and sang psalms of joy and praise before the Lord. The festival was a reminder that God had promised to send a light, the light, to a sin-darkened world. God promised to send a Messiah to renew Israel's glory, to release them from bondage, to restore their joy. 
These candelabras would continue for seven full days, and then the lights were extinguished on the last day. And they used that day as a holy and solemn assembly. So celebration was going on the whole time that they had this feast. The celebration was going on day and night. In the evening, they would light the lights. They were playing music. They were dancing. They were singing. Uh, there was a big celebration. They were eating and feasting. Um, they were going through some rituals, like we talked about pouring out of the water every day, lighting of the candles every day. <clears throat> okay. Um, when, the can when the lights from the candles now extinguished on the last day, they had a day of solemn assembly where they would come together in reverence quietness before God. If you think about it, this must have been some sight, you know, to walk in to the court of the women, which, remember, is the treasury, to walk in and have this celebration going on every night as a festival. It was at this time that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, came to the treasury. And there, by the great but extinguished candles, is when he declared that I am the light of the world. This is what they were using to remember that God brought them through the desert with the fire to light their way. And as a promise that the light would come, the true light would come, the Messiah. Okay? So Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Really, it seems like it must have been an awesome celebration. I mean, if you're into celebrating, I'm sure it was an awesome celebration. But at the same time, think with me, at the same time, it was kind of sad uh, that they even had to have these candles and the candelabras in the first place. Not only was it a celebration and a reminder of the pillar of fire in the desert, even in the temple they had candles and lamps that they had to light every day. Every single evening, they had to light the candles and they had to light the, um, the candelabras in the evening. Okay, we need to take a quick journey with me, real quick, back to the wilderness. Remember when they were traveling in the wilderness and they set up the tabernacle? This was a movable tent where God's presence would dwell. And the people would meet. Moses mostly would meet with God for the people. Okay? That was before the temple. When the temple came, we know they built a building. And it didn't move. And the people came to the building. Okay, so we have a tabernacle in the wilderness. Um, so as we take a journey back to the wilderness, we see the tabernacle set up, which came before the temple building. The glory of God filled the tabernacle. It was the light of the presence of God among his people. The glory of God filled the tabernacle. We have a slide from 2 Corinthians says, For God, who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews 1.3 it says, And he is the radiance of his glory, and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on the high. 
So we see that Jesus Christ is the express image of God. He's the glory of God in a body. So the glory of God came down into the tabernacle. The light of God's presence came down into the tabernacle. And it stayed there for years and years. <clears throat> but because the people grew rebellious and desired to live in the blackness and the darkness of sin, the glory of God left the tabernacle. The Bible says Ichabod, which means the glory has left. The glory has departed. It was written across the tabernacle. The light of the presence of God left the tabernacle. That happened about 12 to 1400 years before the story in John takes place. Before the event that we're reading about in John chapter 8. So for over a thousand years, the real light, the real presence of God was gone from his people. We know for a fact that through the 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, God did not speak to his people. Not that God wasn't working, but God was not speaking. There were no prophets. That's why they called John the Baptist the last of the Old Testament prophets before the New Covenant. presence of God was gone. So now, they were using artificial lights to light the temple. Because the light of God's presence wasn't there anymore. The Bible calls it the Shekinah glory of God. It was no longer there. It was gone because of the rebellion and sin of the people. It's kind of sad that it happened. But you know, when I thought about this, when I read this, and when I thought about it, it's kind of sad that this happened to the Jewish people. But at the same time today, this kind of happens to people, and it happens to churches. Where the presence, the light of God's presence, leaves. The Bible says that God will not always dwell with man. There comes a time in our life, in the life of a church, that if we're so steeped in rebellion and sin and darkness and blackness and we want to do things our way, that the Spirit of God will leave. There's one church growth expert who wrote. <clears throat> he did a study. He wrote in a book. He studied for years the churches in America. And he wrote this. He wrote that if the Holy Spirit was to all of a sudden disappear from the face of the earth, all of a sudden to be removed from our daily life, he believes 95% of church activity would continue and not even notice that the Spirit of God was not That's frightening. And I saw there's lots of people who have wrote who have written the same basic thing. The estimate changes a little bit, but I think the lowest I saw was 80% of all the church work would stop. Would wouldn't even notice. That's frightening. <laughs> That's scary. Uh, we remember one time we heard a story of, I think it was from people from the China Underground Church, I think we might have mentioned this before, came and visited the United States, and as they were leaving after their time was over, they came and visited the churches, and they were heading back to China. Uh, they were asked by the missionaries, so what was the thing that stood out to you the most in the United States and the churches? And I think they said something like, what stood out to us the most is what you can actually accomplish without God. People just plugging away in their programs, their traditions, their rituals. But the glory has departed. Ichabod. The glory has departed. Bankruptcy. 
Remember, they're in the treasury. Bankruptcy. Bankruptcy in the temple. Bankruptcy in the rituals. They're going through the motions and remembering how it was over a thousand years ago. This is a really dark time for them in John chapter 8 that we're reading about. It's a really dark time. But now the glory of God has returned. Do you see this? We catch this? Jesus Christ is the express image of the glory of God. It's a really dark time, but the glory has returned. Jesus has come. Let's go to verse 13. Verse 13 says, So the Pharisees said to him, You are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Way to go, guys. After over a thousand 1,200, 1,400 years. The glory of God is back. And you're trying to extinguish it. You're trying to reject it. Way to go, guys. You're questioning. It's crazy. Verse 14 through 16. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I testify of myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anything. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone in it but I am the Father who sent me. Jesus said, I'm not here to judge. Remember we talked about uh, the statue of justice. Judging according to appearance. Well, Jesus brings it up again. He said, you're, you're judging according to the flesh. That's why he says that you are from below. I'm from above. You're judging according to the flesh, according to appearance. You're, you're judging according to what you see. The scriptures talk about people being able to see without seeing. And that's what's happening. They're seeing, but they're actually not seeing that he is actually the light of the world. They're not seeing. They're seeing him in the flesh. He said, but my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am the Father who sent me. Let's go on to verse 17. No, actually, before we go there, let's... Um, I want to talk a little bit about the you judge according to the flesh. Because when we judge according to the flesh, we don't have righteous judgment. Because we judge according to what we see. We're <laughs> judging a book by its cover we talked about. Um, how we need God's righteous judgment on this earth. Because we judge things according to appearance. We judge things according to our flesh how we need God to judge this world. Our judgment is so fleshy. It's so worldly. It's so off sometimes when we judge things. There was a story by, you probably all heard of Paul Harvey. There was a story one time that Paul Harvey talked about, that there was a man convicted in the courts of New York 
New York, and he was sent, sentenced to 15 years in prison. And the judge told him, before you uh, serve your sentence of 15 years, we're going to let you go home for six months and be with your nine children and your wife. And then you'll come and serve your 15 years. What was he accused of? Child molestation. And the judge sends him home for six months to spend the time with his kids. Like that just flabbergasted. <laughs> Our judgment is so wrong. There's another story. Uh, I need to get back to my son. I'm sorry to put it out of. There's another story. It happened years ago in a place called Deland, Florida. Coming down the highway, you think I-95 into Florida. You come just before you reach this town of Deland, Florida. <clears throat> People on the highway see this sign. Drug inspection check. So as they're traveling down the highway on I-95 and they see this sign, the thing about this sign is there is no drug check. No drug check. So as they see the sign, what happens is they panic. They make an illegal U-turn on the highway to head the other way. And because they make an illegal U-turn, they're pulled over by the Florida Highway Patrol. And as they're pulled over in the course of their citation, they're checked for drugs. And the state of Florida has made a great haul with this sign. <clears throat> the problem with the sign, have you heard of the ACLU? The American Civil Liberties Union. They took him to court. This is a deceptive sign. You're scaring people and you're deceiving them. So this happened quite a few years ago. I don't think the sign is there. That's the type of judgment we have as we, as human beings. It's like, are you kidding me? That's why we need to have God's righteous judgment on this earth. Because our judgment is so amiss. Let's go to verse 17. 17 through 19. Even in your law, Jesus says, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father. So Jesus is testifying about himself. The second witness, he says, is his father. If you remember at the baptism of Jesus Christ, a voice from heaven spoke and said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. But they didn't want to believe his testimony. It wasn't that his testimony wasn't true. They did not want to believe his testimony. Can we say that they were blinded? by the light? Maybe? Okay, go to verse 20 through 24. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Then he said again to them, I go away and you will seek me and will die in your sins. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says where I am going, you cannot come. In 
And he was saying to them, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe, catch this, that I am, the word he is in italics, which means it's not in the original manuscript. Okay? The word he, except for in the ESV, I don't think it's italics in the ESV. But in the New American Standard, the King James, I don't know about the NIV. It's in italics. And I looked it up, and it is not in the original Greek writing. So what Jesus is telling them is this. If you do not believe that I am, remember I am is ego I me in the Greek. It means deity. If you do not believe that I am God, you will die in your sins. Plain and simple, that's what Jesus is telling them. He's spending his whole time telling them who he is. And that's why he said when they said, who are you? He said, what have I been telling you from the beginning? He says in verse 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Guys, this is the number one issue of salvation. This is the number one thing that separates us as Christians from the cults. The cults believe that Jesus is Jesus. They believe that He is the Son of God even. They do not believe that He is deity in the flesh. That's the number one thing that will separate us from the cults. Some believe that He's Lucifer's brother. Some believe that He is a created being. They believe that He is Jesus. They believe that He's a good man. That is a prophet. But the one thing that separates us is that we believe that Jesus is God in we believe that God became a man. That's what he's telling them. The number one issue of salvation. He's saying, do you believe that I am? Do you believe that Jesus is the I am? The ego I me in the Greek, the name of deity. Do you believe that Jesus is God? This is what separates us from all the cults. Salvation hinges on this one main truth. That God became a man. Paul said, great is the mystery. That God was manifested in the flesh. Remember the story of Abraham and Isaac. God told Abraham, take your son Isaac up to the Mount Moriah and sacrifice him there. Sacrifice your one and only son on that mountain for me. So Abraham took him, took Isaac to the mountain. Some people believe that Mount Moriah is the same mountain as Mount Calvary. Draw an analogy here. That's what the story's all about. Let's draw the analogy. Abraham takes Isaac up to the mountain to sacrifice his only son. God told him, uh, Isaac says, Father, here's the fire. Here's the wood. But where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb? The Bible says, son, Abraham says, God will provide the land. Now, some people think that the language that is used, that God will provide for himself a land. Some of the uh, theologians believe that what Abraham, what the scriptures are saying is that God will provide himself a land not provide a lamb for himself. 
I think is the way that it's actually written. But some people think that what God is saying is that he will provide himself as the lamb. The analogy of Jesus Christ being crucified on the cross. God becoming a man. God becoming flesh. Becoming a man and then becoming a lamb to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. God becoming a man and becoming a lamb and died for us is non-negotiable. It is a non-negotiable act. And I understand it and I agree with God on this. Because if I was to, if my house was on fire, say, and I rushed into my house to get my family out of the house. And as I pulled my family out of the flames, and then all of a sudden everything was done, and then all of a sudden I died because of my injuries. And my wife tells my kids, guys, dad pulled you out of the fire. You were pulled to safety. But because of his injuries, he died. And you would say, no, he didn't. That didn't really happen. That was somebody else. That was somebody who looked like him. Or that was somebody, some other being. That wasn't him. I'd be mad. I'd be few. What are you? If you sacrificed yourself and people started to make up these stories, that it wasn't really you. It was somebody else. I heard one man say that, I'd be madder than a hornet. And if I could come back. <laughs> but that, that is the issue of salvation, that God became a man and then became a lamb and was sacrificed for the sins of the world. We can't miss that. In verse 24 it says, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. They knew exactly what he was saying. We saw that, we saw that in the last time that we read in chapter 7. That they wanted to kill him because he was claiming to be deity. Chapter 5, we saw it. After he healed the man of Bethesda, we saw it. They wanted to kill him because he was claiming to be equal with God. And later on in, in chapter 8, I believe we're going to see it again, they're going to pick up stones to stone him because he claims to be God. They understood completely what he meant. They wanted to kill him. And later on we'll see, like I said, they'll pick up stones because they knew he was claiming to be Verse 25 and 26. So they were saying to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, What have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true. And the things which I have heard from him, these I speak to the world. Jesus tells them, I have many things that I could say to you right now. I have a lot of things that I could judge you on right now. But remember John 3.16 said God sent His Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Jesus did not come to judge. He did not come to condemn them. He says, I got a lot of things right now I can lay on you. I got a lot of things I can tell you. But I only speak the things that my Father tells me to speak. Think of how that would help us out. Man, if we, you know, we never regret the things we didn't say. We always regret the things that we did say. We look back and we wish, man, I wish I wouldn't have said that. I wish I wouldn't have said it that way. We hardly ever look back and say, and, and be sorry for something that we didn't say. Because it's usually the things that we do say 
that end up being hurtful or wrong. We can somehow get so in tune with God that we only say the things that He wants us to say as we speak with people. Verse 27 and 28. They did not realize that he was speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. He is in italics again. He said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. And I do nothing of my own initiative. But I speak these things as the Father taught me. Jesus is saying, we know that lifting up, when he says lifting up of the Son of Man, lifting up, he speaks of the cross. When the Son of Man is lifted up on the cross, then you will know that I am. You will know that I am God. When you see me on the cross, you will know that I am. When the sky is darkened, you will know that I am. When the earth shakes, you will know that I am. When the rocks break, you will know that I am. When the graves open up, you will know that I am. When the veil is torn from the top to the bottom, you will know that I am. And they knew. When the crucifixion, crucifixion took place, they knew exactly who he was. In the book of Luke, it says that it says after he was crucified that they beat their breasts and they cried out, oh, What have we done? And when the centurion looked at him, he said, truly, this was the Son of God. For when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. Verse 29 and 30. And he who sent me is with me. He who is he has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he spoke these things, many came to believe him. Think about that. Think about those last two verses. Real simple. It says, I always do the things that are pleasing to him. We don't see anybody speaking up here saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You don't always do the things that are pleasing to God. I saw when you were in school in Galilee and you pulled that little girl's hair. Or I saw when you threw a rock through that whatever at the time. And Nobody speaks up there. Even the religious leaders don't speak up and say, no, you, no, you don't. Wouldn't it be nice if we could say stuff like that? I always do the same thing he tells me to do. I mean, you could say that, but can we say it without being challenged by somebody else? For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. be nice to function that way. And because of his testimony, because of what he was saying there, no one accused him of anything. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Maybe some people thought, hmm. yeah, you know, I've known him for a long time. I actually have not seen him do anything. I don't care. I've seen him for a long time. Maybe he does only do the things that please God.
remember in uh, Matthew chapter 7, 5, 6, and 7, Jesus does, talks about the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, uh, to do good works so that they will glorify your Father in heaven. So if we live, can live our lives doing the things that please him, it will reflect for the glory of God. God will be honored. We won't be honored. We don't want the honor and the glory. But through us, God can be glorified. So that ends chapter 8, verse 30, through verse 30. <clears throat> it was so much that I had to leave out of this. So we'll go on um, next week. We'll continue on at verse 31. Um, just so you know, ahead of time, we'll probably finish the chapter. I can't break it up in the middle. We'll probably go through the verse, last verse, 59. So now you know ahead of time, study, look at it. 31 through 59, John chapter 8. Remember, Jesus is the light of the world. That is the reason he came was to lighten every man's hearts. Remember his coming reflects back to the feast. Get out of here. So let's stand. We'll close the prayer and have some worship. We'll go into setting up for communion and fellowship here. Father, we thank you again, God, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the light of the world. We thank you, God, that even though we spend many years walking in darkness sometimes, that somehow in the midst of the blackness, in the midst of our darkness, somehow that one flicker of light comes through. We thank you for opening our eyes and our hearts that we're able to receive that little flicker of light. And we know that in your word, Father, you tell us that we are the light of the world. Because the Spirit of God lives in us. That light can't help shining out from us. So we pray, God, as we go, as we worship you this afternoon, that you would instill in our hearts that the reason we're the light is because Jesus Christ, the light of the world, came. And he enlightened our hearts. We pray that you be glorified in our worship. You are love, you bring
Amen. Hate it all. That is when, uh, you know, and I felt no worth. It's just incredible that he did. Yeah. 